Hi everyone. This is the second video on the circular flow where I introduce financial markets where I put and I put those right in the middle of the circular flow because that's a nice convenient place for them to be. And you know, financial markets, we're just going to talk about the importance of financial markets in the economy. Now, financial markets actually do a lot of things. We're going to focus on their role as a financial intermediary. And what I mean by that is financial institutions stand between, literally that's why they're financial intermediaries. They stand between people who want to borrow and people who want to save. Okay. Now for simplicity, we're just talking about households in general. So there's some households out there who want to borrow and some households who want to save. Financial markets are going to make that easier for um, households to do. So they're going to make it easier to save and they're going to make it easier to borrow and that's what I want you to get out of this. Okay. <laughs> now there's many different types of financial institutions in the economy. You've got commercial banks like Bank of America or Wells Fargo. You have investment banks like a Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley. You've got uh, insurance companies like Aetna, the uh, Travelers, or the Hartford. You also have private equity firms. You have hedge funds. You have all sorts of financial institutions. To make life simple, we're just going to talk about commercial banks, so things like Bank of America. And to make life even simpler, we won't deal with checking accounts or certificates of deposits. We're just going to focus on savings accounts. Nothing really mu changes much when you make things a little bit more general, but you can get the basic idea just by focusing on savings accounts. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do here. All right, now. So we see that we have financial markets here. Now, households get income. They get to do one of two things with their income. And one of them we've already talked about, which is spending. They can buy stuff on and, uh, the market for goods and services down here in the bottom part of the circular flow. Or, alternatively, they can save. So there are some households, by no means all of them, but there are some households who each month or each year deposit some amount of money in their savings accounts. For example, every month, let's say I put $1,000 in my Bank of America savings account. Okay? That means every month I put $1,000 into financial markets. And it's not just me. Some people put $25 a month. Some people put $50. Some people might put $5,000 or $10,000. But there are all these small amounts of savings done by all these different households out in the economy, and it all goes into financial markets. Now, what do financial markets go ahead and do with these pool of savings? We've got to remember... Financial firms like Bank of America are greedy, profit-maximizing firms, like all other firms. Right? If they're taking in deposits like savings accounts, and they're, uh, the reason why people like me put money in our savings account is Bank of America is willing to um, give us some interest income for those savings accounts. And let's say it's the savings account pays 1% interest. It's actually a lot lower than that right now, but we'll just call it 1% to make the math easy. All right? So Bank of America's incurring a cost. They take my deposits and at the end of the year they're going to give me my deposits back and 1%. Right? So they're incurring a cost. They also have to hire workers, they maintain banks, ATMs, they have online banking so they've got servers and all those things. So Bank of America's got a lot of costs. Now the question is how do they pay for those costs? And they pay for those costs by going ahead and making loans to other households. So some households will go ahead and borrow and let's say somebody is borrowing to buy a house and the current mortgage rate is 5%. Roughly, that's where it is. Well, that means Bank of America is taking in deposits at 1% interest, it's making loans at 5% interest, and it's pocketing the difference. You know, really, it's also paying its salaries and all its other costs throughout there. And after, you know, all the other costs, there, whatever is left over, that's the profits for Bank of America. But roughly, that's how Bank of America goes ahead and makes its profits. It borrows at relatively low interest rates, and then it makes loans at relatively high interest rates okay, to other households. All right. So that's what financial markets do. They stand between borrowers and lenders. Now, you take a look at this, and you might say, okay, so why do financial markets exist? Why do they serve as a middleman? And why, if some households are willing to save at 1%, and others are willing to loan or um, borrow at 5%, why don't those two households get together directly and say, hey, you know, I'll, give, I'll borrow from you at 3%. Well, you'll do better than you would by putting your savings in the Bank of America savings account, and the people doing the borrowing will do better than they would if they borrowed from Bank of America at 5%. And the answer is because it's a lot more efficient for the borrowers and savers to borrow and save with Bank of America. And here's why. 
let's do it from the point of view of the borrowers first. So let's say I'm buying a house and I need a more and I want a mortgage and I need to borrow three hundred thousand dollars all at once. That means if I want to borrow from a household directly and avoid Bank of America, then I've got to find somebody who's willing to loan me three hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And if I can't find one person who's willing to loan me $300,000, then that means I have to cobble the $300,000 together from multiple loans. Well, let's take me for instance. I save $1,000 a month. If somebody needs to borrow $300,000 for a mortgage, they have to find 300 people exactly like me all at exactly the same time. And we all have to say, yeah, this mortgage is a great idea. Let's go ahead and do it. And we all have to come up with terms that are acceptable to the borrower. So as you can imagine, you know, getting a loan for a mortgage can be very time consuming. Imagine if you had to do that 300 times just to get one mortgage. It'd be very time consuming and expensive for people to get mortgages in that scenario. In fact, there'd be very few mortgages that occur. All right. So it's more efficient for households who need to borrow to go to one bank like Bank of America and borrow $300,000 directly from them because it saves on their time. Now, why is it more efficient for um, people who are savings to put their savings in Bank of America? Well, for the same reason, it saves their time. So, for example, if I'm saving $1,000 a month and I want to get a, a higher interest rate than 1%, then that means after working my day job where I spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week or however much it is earning my income that generates $1,000 worth of savings, I then have to go ahead and t spend all the time and effort on going ahead and finding people who want to borrow $1,000 from me. Some people might want to borrow $100, some people might want to borrow $15,000. I can't really help the person out who wants to borrow $15,000, but maybe if someone uh, wants to borrow $500, then I can, if I find two people who want to do that, then I can go ahead and make loans directly to them. But to do that, I've got to go ahead and you know, go through their loan application. I have to figure out, first of all, what to go ahead and ask people on a loan application. I have to go ahead and go through it. I have to figure out who's likely to default and who's not likely to default. And then I have to figure out, uh, then I have to make the loans to the people who are not likely to default. Okay? That's all on top of the regular job you do. As you can imagine, that can be very time consuming. And then you're doing that month after month after month. Right? So it becomes very time consuming and expensive for a household to make loans directly to other households. It's a lot easier for me to go ahead and say, you know what, let me just put $1,000 in my Bank of America savings account. I'll take 1% interest. Bank of America can loan it out or whatever they get and they can keep the difference because once I put the $1,000 in the savings account, I'm done with it. I don't have to worry about it. I can just go on and enjoy my life. Okay? So that's really what the role of finance institutions are. They make the they make borrowing and uh, lending a lot more easy or a lot easier and more efficient for households to go ahead and do. They reduce the cost of those activities, and as a result, they make it easier for um, uh, they make it easy, easier for people to obtain loans for to invest in you know new houses, student loans, car loans, or corporations to go ahead and um, you know, borrow for new fat plant and equipment and things like that. Now, one uh, last little word before I leave. I just wanted to note that, you know, I talked about uh, savings and loans from the perspective of the household. Technically speaking, some firms also borrow from in financial markets, and some firms actually also lend in financial markets. You know, I did. So everything I just said about households is also true of firms. I just didn't want to go through and uh, show it because it's the same thing again. Or alternatively, you can think since all firms are ultimately owned by households in the economy that um, when we talk about savings and borrowing here, we're talking about the same thing uh, or, or we're taking into account firms as well. All right. Well, that's all I wanted to say about uh, financial markets. So the next video, I'll go ahead and try to introduce government into the, equation, or into the diagram. We'll see how that changes things, if at all.